Morning, it's great to see everybody who is here. I know uh, we've got some guests who are here, and so if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Bill, and it's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor here at the table. And so if you are new and I haven't met you yet, um, would love to introduce myself. I'll be available after the service at our uh, I'll hang around somewhere near our guest table. And so if you do have any questions about the church or anything that you hear in the message this morning, we'd love to visit with you for just a few minutes. Um, you know, I, I fear that by clapping for Kelly, you have <laughs> communicated with her that she did really well today. And there's this sense in which she did good, right? She communicated effectively. But our measure of success is not did she communicate effectively what she was supposed to, but the measure of success is you doing what she asked you to do. So if you really think Kelly did a good job, you need to sign up to serve somewhere, and then we'll talk on Tuesday about how good Kelly did. So if nobody does anything, it doesn't matter what you thought in the service, it was not good. Um, no, we, we're, not, we're not that bad. I'm also curious, I don't know if you picked up on this, what Ross said earlier about how Saginaw and the Bahamas are similar. I can't, I've never been to the Bahamas, but I cannot imagine two more dissimilar places on the planet. So I'm kind of curious about that as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. So anyway, glad that you guys are here this morning. Let me pray for us, and we're going to jump into our new series that we're beginning today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, God, as we gather together today, I recognize that we do so, all of us with different things that are on our mind and on our hearts, different things that, things that we're struggling with. And God, I just pray, even as um, we have sung your praise. Maybe there was a lyric in a song that really touched our hearts. And so, God, I, I pray that you would comfort those who are hurting. Um, God, challenge those of us who need to be challenged. Uh, so, God, just be with us today as we gather together here. We are here um, for you because of what you've done. And, and, God, we recognize our dependence upon you, our need for you and your work in our lives. Um, so God, continue to, to minister to us as we spend a few minutes in your word today. Show us how to live. Um, give us comfort and encouragement knowing why it is that we believe what we do. And so God, just be at work in our midst this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You've probably heard all of these before. Many of them were on our little bumper video to introduce the new series but why is it that we park in a driveway and drive on a parkway? Why is it that there are braille dots on the buttons of a drive-up ATM machine? Why are things the way that they are? Why is it that when you send a package in the mail, when it is in a truck or on a car, it's shipment, but as soon as it goes on a boat, it becomes cargo? Why is it that fat chance and slim chance mean the exact same thing? You ever thought about that? Why is it that what a doctor does is practice medicine? See, I don't know about you. I don't really want a doctor to practice. Maybe perform really, really well. You know, the thing is about all of that stuff, there's probably a reasonable explanation for why the things are the way that they are. But I have no idea why any of those things are the way they are. They just become normal to us, and we just accept it, and we go on. Well, we're beginning a new series of messages today called, Why Do We Do That? And so we're going to be talking about some of the things that we do in church. Now, for those of us who have been around church for a really long time, have a church background, most of the things that we do in church are very normal may not know exactly why we do what we do, but it is what it is, and you just kind of accept it, and you go on. It's, there's nothing unusual. But some of you don't necessarily come from a church background, don't have much experience in church. Maybe you're uh, in church for the first time, or, or maybe you've only been a, a handful of times in your entire life, and you walk in and out of a service every time that you go, and you wonder to yourself, why do they do that? Like, why is it that we have a sing-along portion at the beginning of services every week? Or why is it that halfway through the service we pass a tip jar? That's not what it is. <laughs> Just for reference, we're going to talk about that in this series. Or if you're here on the right Sunday, why is it that we have this weird dunking ritual that serves to be an initiation into this faith? Why do we 
sometimes take little tiny shots of grape juice with this square, stale cracker. Why do we do that? Now, for those of us who have a church background, have been around church for a long time, we can understand how all of those things might seem strange to someone who's walking into church for the very first time. Because we don't experience those things anywhere else. But I think that there is one thing that for those of us who are part of church on a regular basis would not see as being strange. But it's something that for those of you that don't have a church background, I would bet that you have wondered this question. And the question is this, why do we believe what the Bible says? People wonder that because everyone knows about the Bible. The Bible is the number one best-selling book of all time. It was the first book ever printed on a printing press. People know about the Bible. Everyone knows about the Bible. They know that it's a supposedly ancient book. So it comes from a long time ago, but it's really changed a lot over the years. And what we have today is just a translation of a translation of a translation. So there's no way to really trust what we have today. Some people have heard that there are other stories about Jesus that aren't included in the Bible. And the reason that those aren't included in the Bible is because they didn't fit the narrative that the church wanted to share. But they tell the real stories about Jesus. People have heard lots of things about the Bible. They've heard enough to know that the Bible can't be trusted. But then you walk into a church like ours, and you hear a message that comes from the Bible, and sometimes we talk about different stories in the Bible, and the way that we talk about them is as if we believe that they are true. And you hear that, and you say to yourself, why do you believe what the Bible says? So we're beginning this new series today. We're going to talk about why we do many of the things that we do in church. We're going to talk about why we have an offering, why we give. We're going to talk about why we do communion, things like why we pray. But we're actually going to spend three weeks on why we believe what the Bible says. Because it's so fundamental to everything else that we do. If we didn't believe what the Bible says, then why would we do all the other things that we do? So we're going to begin today with more of a a general overview why we believe the Bible. Next week, we're going to talk about why we read the Old Testament. And then two weeks from today, we'll finish this Bible section of this series by talking about why we trust the New Testament. So again, today, a little bit more of an overview. Why do we believe what the Bible says? So if you do have a copy of the Bible with you, I would invite you to turn to the passage that we're looking at today. It is Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. So Hebrews is a book in the New Testament towards the back of the New Testament. Uh, you can turn there, Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's going to be on the screen as I read it. Or uh, if you have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, you can navigate your way to our live event and follow along there. I do this every once in a while. I actually had somebody after the first service Ask me, how do we get there? Okay, so if you have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, here is how you get there. You open it up, and on the bottom right-hand corner, there's a button for more. So you hit that button, and then on the next screen, about halfway down the page, there is a button for events. I click that events, and hopefully you have your location services turned on, and then all of a sudden, a list of live events from different churches in the area will pop up. Ours should be at the top of the list, if it works right, because it's geolocated, or at very near the top of the list. And so you click on that, and there's lots of helpful things there. All of the notes that you see on the screen, oftentimes even more than that, are in the version. Um, the scripture is there. Or we send out a weekly update via text message and email, and that, there's a link to that in there. Lots of other helpful things in there as well. Questions for further reflection. Lots of stuff in there, so it's a helpful resource. Let me read for us Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. And this is what the Bible has to say about itself. It says, For the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. What we know is the book of Hebrews is actually a letter. It's a letter written to Jewish Christians 
who, as a result of persecution or the threat of persecution and really just the challenges of living out the new Christian faith in a world that's hostile to their beliefs, is considering turning their backs on Christianity and going back to just be Jewish again. And so the author of Hebrews writes this letter to them to say, don't turn back. You can't turn back. What are you turning back to? Because Jesus is better. And so we see that especially in the early chapters of the book of Hebrews. We get into chapter 4, and the author is talking about rest. Rest that was promised by God to the people of Israel once they entered into the promised land. But they weren't able to enter into that rest. So it was Joshua who led the people of Israel across the Jordan River and into the promised land. And as they got settled into the land that God had promised them, they were supposed to experience rest, but they never did. And so what Joshua could not do, Jesus came to do. It is Jesus who came to give us rest. And as the argument goes, the author says, the reason that the the people of Israel in the Old Testament that we read about never experienced rest was because they constantly disobeyed. And so they were never able to experience the rest in the land that God had promised. So he says, well, how is it that we don't end up just following in the same pattern that they established? It's through obedience to the word of God. Because the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any any two-edged sword, able to, to pierce as deeply as separating soul from spirit. It's the Bible, obedience to the word of God. It's the the word of God that we're supposed to be following and making sure that we understand so that we take it and apply it to our lives. But people say all kinds of things about the Bible. So how is it that we can believe what the Bible actually says? I'm going to give you three things this morning. First, the reason that we believe what the Bible says is because it is inspired. The reason that we say the Bible is inspired is because it is the Word of God. That's the way Hebrews 4.12 re- refers to the Bible. It is the Word of God. And maybe you've heard people refer to the Bible in that way. Why is it that we refer to the Bible as the Word of God? We refer to the, we refer to the Bible as the Word of God because it is inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, the Apostle Paul is writing to a young pastor named Timothy, and he says that, All scripture is breathed out by God or inspired. And so Paul is writing to Timothy and saying to him, make sure that you teach the scriptures because it's the scripture that is breathed out by God. It is the word of God that's given to us. It's inspired. Now, as I say that, I know this every single week. Some of you pay really, really close attention to the things that I say, and that's really good. And so sometimes you walk away and ask really difficult questions, and I think that's really good. But some of you might have developed a question based on what I just said, because we refer to the Word of God as the 66 books of the Bible, what we have in our Bibles today. But you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, because Paul was writing to Timothy before the New Testament was written. And so when Paul's writing to Timothy, saying to him, all Scripture is breathed out by God, He's referring to the Old Testament. He's telling Timothy to make sure that he teaches the Hebrew scriptures. So why is it that we would say that the 66 books of the Bible that we have today are, is the word of God, breathed out by God or inspired? And I would say to you, man, that's a great question. But the reason that we do that is because of what we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. There in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, Peter is writing about Paul's writings. And so Peter says, be really diligent to pay attention to Paul's writings. Be patient as you seek to understand them because they are difficult to understand and people will come in and try to twist his words like they do with other scriptures. And so all of a sudden we have this word, scripture, that's most often used of the Old Testament as we read it in the New Testament, But Peter is referring to Paul's writings in the exact same way. So that we would say today, what we have in our Bibles, the 66 books of the Bible, all of it is inspired by God. When we say that, what we mean is that what we have in the 66 books of the Bible is exactly what God intended us to have. That's what it means that it's inspired. So it's more than just, it's really good, though it is that. 
more than just something inspirational happen when it was being written and put together. But what we mean is that what we have in the 66 books of the Bible is exactly what God wanted us to have. But some of you might be thinking, but how do we know that? I was told that the Bible has been changed so much over the years that what we have today is just a translation of a translation of a translation. There's no way to know that what we have today is what the Bible originally said. And I want you to know that that is just not true. You'll have to come back over the next two weeks to talk about how we got the Old Testament and how we get the New Testament and why we can rely on both of those. But just for our purposes today, here's what I want you to know. We can be confident that what we have today in our modern English translations, and this is true for all of them, is a great representation of the original because of really, really good scholarship. So there are people that study the original languages and go back and look at ancient manuscripts. So what we have today is not a translation of a translation of a translation. People go back to the original manuscripts of the New Testament that go back into the second century. They examine all of those manuscripts and then work together to develop a translation that represents what it said originally and makes sense in our cultural context today. See, the story of the Bible is not somebody walking through the woods one day and stumbling upon a leather-bound book that looks something like this and saying, hey, this is the Bible. That's not the story. The story is good scholarship and understanding has led us to where we are today. That's why we trust the Bible. So the Bible is inspired. It's come to us through good scholarship. Now think about this. The Bible was written over roughly a 1,500-year period by 40 authors in three languages, but it tells one story. The Bible was written over approximately a 1,500-year period in three different languages by 40 authors, but yet it tells one story. You can't make that up. The first book of the Bible is the book of Genesis, which I believe was written by Moses during the time of the wilderness wandering, so after he had led the miraculous escape of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, during that 40-year period, that's when he wrote the first five books of the Bible. That took place in 1440 B.C. Some people believe, and I do too, that the book of Job actually predates uh, the writing of Genesis, and Job's story predates much of what we read in Genesis, probably taking place long before the life of Abraham. The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation, which was written just prior to the end of the first century A.D. Approximately 1,500 years. Most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. There's a little bit of a section in the book of Daniel. It's written in Aramaic. The entire New Testament was written in Greek. 1,500 years. Three languages. 40 authors, 66 books, one story. The story of the Bible is the revelation of the glory of God through the redemption of humanity. The story that the Bible tells is a story of the revelation of the glory of God through the redemption of humanity. It's really important that we recognize that God is the subject of the story. It's really important. We're really significant supporting actors in that story, but it's not about us. It's ultimately about God. At the beginning, it tells the story of creation as God reveals himself through creation, but then there's the fall and separation. But even in the midst of that, God made a promise that one day a Savior would come to make everything right. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, everything that we read either prepares for or points to the coming of that Savior. Helps us to understand why we are so in desperate need of a Savior. We get into the New Testament with the Gospels, and that's where Jesus showed up. And he lived a perfect and sinless life and laid down his life for us on the cross. And the end of the Gospels is the death and resurrection of Jesus and all that he has accomplished for us. As the story continues, it tells the story of the spread of Christianity out to the world, helps us to understand how we are to live as Christians, and we get to the end of the story when that same Savior makes everything right. 1,500 years, three languages, 40 authors, 66 books, but one incredible story that even begins and ends in the exact same place. 
Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve were created and placed in the Garden of Eden. It was a paradise. In that garden, there was a tree, the tree of life. Fast forward all the way to the end. In Revelation chapter 22, we read of a new paradise. This one not depicted so much as a garden, but depicted as a city. And in that city, there is a tree. It's the tree of life, created in paradise to return to paradise. We believe the Bible because it is inspired. It is exactly what God wanted to give to us. But again, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. I thought men wrote the Bible. How can we say that it's what God intended to give to us? And that is true. Men or people wrote scripture, but they were inspired by God. It's really interesting. There is one book of the Bible that we do not know who the author is. And that is the book of Hebrews. There are different theories as to who wrote it and even different theories as to why we don't know who wrote it. One of the theories as to why we don't know who wrote it is because it was written by a woman. Now, we don't know that, but that's a theory that's out there. Now, so God gave us scripture written by human beings, people, men who were inspired by him. I don't know why I pictured this this way when I was growing up in church and we talked about how people were inspired in writing the scripture. But the way that I always pictured that was a person alone in a really dark room, one candle on a desk, and they're just writing. Their hand is moving. They don't even know what they're doing, but it, it, something is happening. Or like it was, they were hearing the voice of God and just taking dictation from God and they were writing things down. Now there are certain sections in the Bible where that's sort of true, especially in the prophets in the Old Testament where God said this and they wrote it down. When Revelation, God told John, write this down and he wrote it down. But for the most part, most of scripture was written by real people who lived in real places who communicated real truth. The Bible is written by real people in real places, and they communicated real truth. The reason that I would say that is because their personalities and writing style shows up on the pages of Scripture. We don't necessarily see it in English because it's been translated for us, but it shows up in the original languages. So I studied a lot of Greek in my college and seminary days, And if you were to ever take a Greek class, right, that's the original language of the New Testament, as you begin to learn the alphabet and learn some words and things like that, the first passage of Scripture that you're going to look at or first book that you're going to look at is the Gospel of John. The reason being, John's really easy. Simple writing style, simple sentence structure, vocabulary is really common. Paul, on the other hand, is very different than that. The letters that he wrote, some of the letters that Paul wrote, what we read as a chapter is like, it's one sentence. We don't read it that way in the English because the English language does not support that, but you can do that in Greek. So there's like a hundred words, it's like one sentence. That's the reason that Peter said what he did about Paul. Sometimes he's hard to understand because he's got really, really long sentences. So be patient. But to me, this is all, it's very reassuring because the Bible's, it's real. I don't have to suspend disbelief at every single turn. So we believe what the Bible says first because it's inspired. The second reason that we believe what the Bible says is because it is infallible. To say that the Bible is infallible means that it is without error in everything that it teaches. The Bible is without error. Now, in some ways, this is a a presuppositional argument. I'll, I'll give you that. So here's what I mean. If the Bible is the word of God, comes to us from God, and is exactly what God wanted to give to us, and we believe that God is perfect and infallible, then his word must also be infallible. So if it comes to us from God, then it has to be without error. I know some of you are thinking, but wait a minute. I have been told that there are errors and contradictions in the Bible. What do we do with that? What I would say is, that there are some apparent, apparent errors 
and contradictions in the Bible. And all of those errors and contradictions have nothing to do with the essential nature, saving nature of our faith. So it's not about like differences of, about how to have a relationship with God or something like that. They're all minor issues. But most of those apparent errors or contradictions can be reconciled either through context that helps us to understand what a passage means or by thinking about point of view. I'll give you a couple examples. So sometimes it's argued that Jesus has a different view on a subject than what Paul does. One of those issues that shows up a lot in, in churches now is the view of women. It's a, a, obviously a big cultural topic related to the Bible. And so it seems like Jesus was a fan of women. So he let Mary sit at his feet, learn from his teaching. There were a group of women who traveled around with Jesus, supporting his ministry. But then you get to Paul, and sometimes it's argued that Paul is, uh, sometimes people use this word misogynistic, because Paul will say something like this in 1 Corinthians 14. Women should remain silent in the church, and if you have a question, go home and ask your husband. And so you can understand, especially within our culture, people are like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. So how do you reconcile these two things? Jesus seems to be a fan of women, and then Paul says, don't ever say anything. If you've got a question, go home and ask your husband. It's context. That's how we reconcile those things. I'll, if you want to know what I think about 1 Corinthians 14, come find me after the service. I don't have time to give it to you today, but I will say this. He can't mean what it seems like he's saying. The reason that I say that is because he can't, so he can't mean never say anything in church, blanket statement, because in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, women, when you speak in church, do it this way. So unless he's contradicting himself a couple of chapters apart, like we got to figure out something else is happening there. The other issue might be a point of view issue. So a story in the Gospels, that's typically the way it is because we have many stories that are recorded for us, the same story is recorded for us in the different Gospels, sometimes with different details. And oftentimes it's, it's simply just a point of view issue. Think about this. If we were all a witness to a crime and a detective comes and begins to interview us, if he hears from us all of the exact same details, he knows something is wrong. The reason that we would say the exact same thing in the exact same way is because we've talked to each other and gotten our story straight. Because our brains don't work that way. So when something happens, it's unexpected, and all of a sudden there's this stimuli, we're trying to sort through it all, and we're going to remember things differently. And that's just the way it is. And so a story in the, that we read in the Gospels, one author is going to include the details that he wants for his purpose. Other author is going to include the details that he does to meet his purpose. Maybe some of that's just talking to different people as they remember that story a little bit differently. It doesn't mean that it's made up. But I will tell you this. The biggest challenge for us today is in understanding the way that the Bible was meant to be understood. The biggest challenge for us today is in understanding the way that the Bible was meant to be understood. Every book in the Bible was written to real people who lived in real places who had real problems. And the Bible was written to address their real problems. There is not one single book in the Bible that was written to nameless, faceless people that exist outside of culture somewhere. It was all written to real people in real places who had real problems. And so sometimes, because there's always culture that's involved, sometimes the culture is obvious. And we know exactly what to do with that culture. At other times, it's less obvious and we're not exactly sure what to do with it. That's why we have to be diligent to study, to understand the way that it was meant to be understood so that we can take it and apply it rightly to our lives. But that's the challenge that faces us. So we believe what the Bible says because it is inspired. That's number one. Second reason we believe what the Bible says is because it is infallible. It's without error. The third reason that we believe what the Bible says is because it is effective. To say that the Bible is effective means that it does what it was meant to do. It helps us to become more like Jesus. This is Hebrews 4.12. It says, The word of God is living and effective. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. The Word of God does what it was meant to do. I want to take a little bit of a rabbit trail really quickly. And this rabbit trail is really for those of you who've been around church a really, really long time. 
So at some point, if you were to ever take a theology class, like an intro to theology class, one of the things that you're going to talk about inevitably is anthropology, our understanding of who we are as human beings and how we are made. And there are two different theories for that in theology. There is a theory that we are made of two parts, another theory that we are made up of three parts. If you want really fancy words to apply to that, it's dichotomist and trichotomist. I went to school for a really long time to know what those words mean, so... Um, so dichotomous means that we're made of two parts. And I would say that I fit into that category. If you want to know the truth, that's what I believe. That there is a material part of us and an immaterial part of us. The other side says that we're made of three parts. The three parts are body, soul, and spirit. And Hebrews 4.12 is the proof text for that. I do not believe, I could be wrong, I do not believe that the author of Hebrews is making a big point about the makeup of humanity. It's not saying that we're made up of three parts. In the same way that I also believe that they're not making a big point about anatomy, human anatomy, where it says that it's the word of God separates joints from marrow. Because if he were, that would be where I would get a little bit confused because marrow is what's inside of bones, and I'm not really sure what it has to do with joints. But the point of Hebrews 4.12 is that the Bible does what it was meant to do. It pierces us to the very core, helps us to understand what really motivates us or the value systems that we live by, and it changes those things so that it does what it was meant to do. It helps us to know how to live. The Bible is effective. And that's the reason we have to study it, read it, hear it taught, so that we know it so that it can change us. Now, having said all that, I want to set you up for success, though, because maybe based on what we read in in Hebrews 4.12, you're thinking, man, I'm going to go read the Bible. I've never really done that before. I'm going to go do it, and because every day I want the Bible to, to pierce my very soul. And I just want to be careful. I want to set you up for success. Because if you start reading the Bible, there may be days where you walk away thinking, man, this is life changing for me. And then all of a sudden you're going to read it on one day and you're going to read a section of scripture and you're like, I don't even know what to do with this. Because you've just read from the book of Leviticus about some weird cleansing rituals that you have to do when you get a skin disease. And you're thinking to yourself, if I get a rash, I'm going to the doctor, they're going to give me a cream and that's going to take care of it. So I don't really know what this is supposed to do. I once heard a pastor say this, in reading scripture, you need to expect a lot of Tuesdays. Now, what's so special about Tuesday? I did this in a class, one of our growth groups, not that long ago, and somebody said, oh, I know what's special about Tuesday. It's Taco Tuesday. Okay, so outside of Taco Tuesday, what's so special about Tuesday? Nothing. All right, Sunday, it's the day we gather for church. Monday's the beginning of the work week. Wednesday's hump day. We feel like we're you know, on the downside of the week. Thursday, the weekend's almost here. Friday's the beginning of the weekend. Saturday is the day we have fun and do all the things that we want to do. But there's nothing special about Tuesday. So when you read scripture, there are going to be days where you think, man, that truth that I just read, it hits me right where I'm at. It's life-changing today. But you're probably going to have a lot of Tuesdays. Or you walk away thinking, that was interesting, but it's not really revolutionary. It didn't change my life today. But that's okay, because Scripture will change your life in ways that you do not see. It is the disciplined, consistent reading of the Word of God over time that is necessary so that when a crisis happens, or you find yourself in a situation where you do not know what to do, you have the foundation of the Word of God to rely on. The Bible's effective. You know, the reality is people say all kinds of things about the Bible. It's a translation of a translation of a translation. There are other stories that are actually the true stories, and none of those things are true. The reason that we believe the Bible is because it is inspired and infallible, and it's effective. It changes us. So I've got a challenge for us. And that is over these next three weeks, as we continue to talk about why we believe the Bible, I want you to read the Bible every single day. So recognizing that's the challenge that you have, you've got to develop a plan. Now, there is a plan that many of us have been doing throughout the year where we're reading through the Bible, and the link is in our YouVersion event. Um, and so you could sign up to, to be a part of that. You can jump in where we are 
Uh, we are finishing up Nehemiah. And so I think we're past most of the boring stuff. Um, so it should be interesting from here on out. But if you feel like that's overwhelming, that's okay. The YouVersion app has a lot of great Bible reading plans that lay out exactly what to read every single day. So start with the New Testament. Find a plan that where you read the gospel or, or a gospel um, over the next few weeks. Just read that and let the word of God change you. Because that's the foundation of our faith. It is exactly what God wanted to give to us. The 66 books of the Bible that tells one story. It's what God wanted to give to us. It's infallible. It is without error in everything that it teaches. And it does what it was meant to do. It changes us. And that's why we believe what the Bible says. Will you pray with me?